the Revisionary Podcast with your host, Juan Carlos. The Revisionary Podcast. Hello, 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 and welcome to another episode of the Revisionary Podcast. And as always, I'm your host, Juan Carlos. If you've never listened to the show, the way that works is I bring on guests. A lot of them are comedians. And they give them an opportunity to tell a real nonfiction story about their lives in which they wish things had gone a little bit different. Afterwards, they have the opportunity to tell the same exact story, except this time they can change any facts or details that they like about their story. And then we discuss the impact of the changes that they've made. With that being said, I have a few announcements for you guys. First and foremost, uh, that contest that I've been talking about for a while, let me explain. The way it works because people have been asking me, is all you have to do to enter is give us a five-star review on Apple Podcasts, tell people what you like about this podcast, write it down, and then take a screenshot and send it to the Revisionary Podcast. After you send me the screenshot, you'll be entered in a raffle, and uh, we're going to be announcing the winner on February 13th, and the winner, some lucky winner is going to walk away with 50 bucks. Anyone can enter. Literally anyone can enter. Uh, It's really simple. And the reason why we're doing it that way, the, the way we're going to decide the winner, just so you know, just to complete, keep this completely fair, we're going to add the names to this uh, website. It's, it's kind of like a generator. And then I'll post the video on social media. So make sure that you're following us on all social media sites so you can see the video for yourself and you can find out who wins. They're going to get the 50 bucks and, you know, you can enjoy it. And is there really an easier way in the world to make 50 bucks? I don't think so. But anywho, without further ado... Let's jump into this because I have another exciting guest this week. Uh, We actually have comedian Tracy Jane uh, joining us, which should be a lot of fun. So what I'm really excited about with working with Tracy is uh, I met her in such a weird way. We were part of this show called Slosh in New York City, which is uh, it's an interesting show. The, The concept of it is that you compete and you come onto the show and you kind of have to like take a shot. Before you do a short set, so it'll be 30 seconds, and you try to compete to go as long as you can, and by the end of it, whoever's left standing has had an embarrassing amount of alcohol, but it's always a good time. It's one of my favorite shows to do in New York City, just because it's different, you know, and it's fun, and it's usually high energy. I've had the pleasure of doing it. Uh, Thank you to Ian Connor. Shout out to Ian Connor. And uh, I've, you know, I've judged the show. I've been a contestant. It's always an honor and a pleasure. It's so much fun. I really, really do enjoy doing the show. But I had the pleasure of meeting uh, Tracy while she was competing on the show. And my favorite fact about Tracy that I love telling people, and she doesn't seem to mind, so it's okay, is that for those of you guys who have ever watched um, the movie Wolf of Wall Street, Tracy Jane is actually uh, the actress who plays uh, the stripper who gets to dance on uh, Leonardo DiCaprio. And if I'm not mistaken, she even gives him a little kiss on the cheek. So if you've ever wondered what uh, a woman looks like who has had the pleasure of uh, kissing Leonardo DiCaprio, then look no further because Tracy is here. So I'm really excited. I always enjoy uh, talking to Tracy because she's always full of like these crazy stories. She's done so much in life. You know, she's traveled the world. Uh, she's a veteran. You know, she served in our military and the armed forces. So she's just this wonderful, interesting human, and I'm really excited. So without further ado, let's go ahead and see if we can get Tracy on the line. Hey, Tracy, how are you? Hey, good to see you. Oh, man, pleasure's all mine. You're one of my favorite people to talk to. You're one of mine. And oh, I'm stop excited. it. <laughs> and look at that smile. Oh, my God, I'm just so happy to see a warm, friendly face and this <laughs> cute one on top of that. Oh, stop. Excited. You're making me blush. <laughs> So what have you been up to? How's everything going? Um, well, wh- while I was on lockdown, I had a stationary bike, and I watched all 12 seasons of RuPaul's Drag Race. And I got <laughs> when shit was scary outside, it was nice to be comforted with drag queens, glitter, big hair. I mean, that, that's the way to go. Like, it got to the point that my inner monologue sounded like a drag queen i'd be in my apartment by myself going oh girl that is fabulous <laughs> <laughs> it's funny i so i've seen a few episodes of the show i watched it pure accident but i didn't know that people could be so creative and so imaginative with so little like such little tools available to them. i was in shock yeah and i'm 
an artsy fartsy person. I've done costumes for off Broadway and, and such. So it's like, I am so into it. You know, plus again, when you're locked up in a studio in New York, in the outside world is so scary with germs. Oh my gosh, give me drag queens and puppets. That's all I want. <laughs> After 2020, I think that's all I'm going to be surrounded with and hang out with is just like drag queens and puppets. <laughs> <laughs> oh, did you say puppets or puppies? Puppets. Puppets. Got it. I'm, I'm working on a show with puppets as well. And we were supposed to start filming right before the apocalypse happened. No. <laughs> yeah. And there are some um, uh, big stations that have shown genuine interest in it. And we haven't even filmed the pilot yet. So I was really excited. I have built a cast of puppets. I have nine of them. Do you know how long it takes to build nine puppets it's it's like an opus of work so i'm i'm really wanting this to get going and the damn apox apocalypse happened wait, wait, wait. You, know? Did you build these puppets by hand yeah are you a ventriloquist no okay. i can just make stuff <laughs> <laughs> oh i see so it's the puppets where you stick your hand in and you're like doing yeah. the oh, okay so i'm making the puppets and i'm in the show Got but it. i'm not actually doing somebody else that's a brilliant puppeteer will actually be doing the, the puppeteering. Got it. I'll I was be a, smart I, Alec. I was imagining you like on some Jeff Dunham stuff, you know, just like all of a sudden, just like throwing your voice and doing all these like weird characters and just, you know, crushing it like you do. Oh, shucks. Not, not so much that this is, um, mm, a little more, a little more on the Muppet side, mm. except a little more adult. Okay. It's more for adults than actually for the kids. <laughs> so not your father's Muppets. <laughs> That's wonderful. And what else have you been doing? Have you, have, like, have you enjoyed the time off in terms of like uh, your creative growth? Have you been able to like write more and stuff like that? No. <laughs> <laughs> I get it. I can't think straight. I don't know what day it is, and you want me to think about jokes? <laughs> what? <laughs> I mean, it's been going like for about four or five years since March. I mean, it's just dragging smooth out. Oh my goodness. So now, uh, of course, like everybody else. When we started this lockdown thing, we made all these plans of all these things we were going to do. All I wanted was to floss more and drink less. Ah, that How'd that go? <laughs> <laughs> I'm glad that for the most part, you seem okay. And you know, we're here. We're going to make the best of it. And we're going to get through this. I promise. But uh, well, why don't we uh, go ahead and uh, just jump right into this. Uh, Tracy, the stage is yours. Why don't you go ahead and tell us your story? What am I veering towards? Am I veering towards because ex-military kind of stuff? Or am I veering more towards working in a, a titty bar? <laughs> Let's go to the go-go bar. Let's see where that takes us. Yeah, yeah. Okay, all right. Okay. <laughs> so, next time we'll talk about the military. All right. So all right. Uh, I, I am ex-military. Um, I've been, you know, working multiple jobs since high school, put myself through school, so anyway, so I, uh, I got into comedy after college. I moved to Houston pretty much on a dart on a map. And uh, I, I got into comedy down there. And at that time, it was one of the best spots to get started because you had multiple clubs in the city and, you know, plenty in driving distance. So you could be like a touring comic locally very early on. And that that stage time is invaluable in getting started. Absolutely. So I was actually, I was a, I was a corporate artist and I was traveling around. I was taking care of restaurants and painting murals and all this cool stuff. And, uh, you know, I, I, I got into comedy and it was hard. They wanted, they walked into the studio and would say, okay, go home, pack your things, get ready. Cause you're leaving in three days and you're going to be gone like three months, you know, traveling around the country painting and, lettering on Joe's crab shacks and, you know, restaurants and things. I was like, man, I want a boyfriend. I want to get gigs and tell <laughs> jokes. So, uh, <laughs> so, uh, 
So after 9-11 happened, you know, everybody kind of reevaluated their lives and, and, uh, and I ended up leaving the corporate job and pursuing comedy. And I worked four jobs at a time for over a year. How? Different bars, you know, just so that, you know, I could get a couple shifts here, a couple shifts there so that I could call off right. on a regular basis so I could go play the road and pursue comedy. So that's where I was. Okay. You don't get the best shifts in the bar when you're only there twice a week. You get the crappy shifts. So I was working my butt off and struggling so hard with money that finally, one day, I slammed a few glasses of wine and said, all right, I'm doing this. <laughs> Put in my application at the titty bar. <laughs> I mean, that, that is how I started comedy, you know, put a few shots back. I was like, oh, I'm doing this. <laughs> Sometimes I'm burying my soul and telling people all the worst things about me in an open room of strangers who couldn't care less. Nobody is, you know, growing up, going to dance classes and they're, you know, pasties and thong bikini and, you know, <laughs> going, I'm going to be a stripper someday. <laughs> Come Look, on, there's no money in ballet. You know that. <laughs> I'm just saying, no one goes to the gym and goes, yeah, let me do the comedian workout. You know what I mean? There's a, there's a whole culture in the workout about, you know, the stripper uh, workout, the, the pole dancing. I'm just saying. Well, you know what? Don't worry about that because... You know, I'm actually ex Navy, and there's no Navy workout either. <laughs> we were just like <laughs> fat and dumb and on a ship for like four years. You know, people ask me, "Well, didn't you learn to kill people?" No, <laughs> I learned to float on my pants <laughs> in case I fell off the boat. <laughs> <laughs> True story. So anyway, Anywho, so sorry. Go ahead. I am putting in my application to be a cocktail waitress at the titty bar. Woo. Right. And it was, it was the nice one too. Cause I'm in Houston and Houston at that time. I mean, it had, you know, more titty bars per capita than grocery stores. So, I mean, they, they knew what they were doing. They took, they took their titty bar world very <laughs> seriously. I mean, you had like a range like, uh, of from really dirty, like borderline whorehouse types to, I mean, really high-end gentlemen's clubs where, I mean, the girls just, I mean, they look like models. I mean, they were just gorgeous. And, you know, you didn't, you didn't go in there and just spend $20 in a back corner, in a dark corner and go out. I mean, you had to right. really be ready to throw some coin down to, to hang out there for even a little bit. So anyways, I worked at the fanciest one. Ooh. And I mean, they, like they have back rooms, like the, like the dressing room, they have a hair salon, they have a makeup artist, they have showers, they have everything. I mean, it's almost as big as the front of the club. It's, they're huge. Right. And very nice too. Like, like very expensive country club locker room, kind of locker room, not metal lockers and ching, 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 and everything <laughs> filthy and beat up and you know right. the paint chipped off no it's like all really fancy but like some of the things back there they had been there a while you know drunk girls come back and they pee and they vomit on the couch and gross and it, it's still a place to house very drunk people right <laughs> <laughs> that are not behaving in the best place. <laughs> <laughs> so I was still working another job and I worked 50 hours in the other job and I was cocktail waitressing at night that week. So I worked so much. I was so exhausted and it was rainy on a Sunday night and was slow in the bar. So they offered to cut me as a waitress and, uh, cause you know, when you're waiting tables, that's all you're, you're like, cut me, let me go home. Cut me, cut me, cut me. I'm not making money. Cut me. <laughs> right. So, so, uh, so they let me go. I was exhausted. It's rainy and cold outside. So I was like, oh yeah, I'm going to hop in the tanning bed. Cause they had a free tanning bed. Ooh. Yeah. yeah. So free tanning bed at the titty bar. So I'm going to hop in and then I'm going to go home. And I, and I, oh, it was so warm. The light went off. That part's important. Okay. <laughs> I, was there. I tanned, the light went off, 
and it was just so warm and cozy inside and cold outside. And I, I heard the, the DJ still playing. And then I woke up and it was four o'clock in the morning. No. <laughs> and I was locked in the kitty bar all by myself. <laughs> and I was walking around and I was going, hello? <laughs> hello? <laughs> and I was so scared. And I didn't want to touch anything or like try to go out an exit door because I was like, oh no, you know, I'm going to set off alarms. Right. The police are going to come. And I don't even want that scene. I don't even want to start to think about how that's going to go down. And it's not any fun because all the booze is locked up. So I'm locked into the titty bar. And I, and I went back to the locker room and I lay down on the scummy couch. Mm-hmm. And I was like, oh my God. Oh God. I'm scared. <laughs> and this is so gross. And I'm going to get fired like I was the bad stripper. <laughs> <laughs> and I lay there sleeping until about like seven or eight in the morning, which, which, you know, that's really early for someone who works in titty bars. Anyway, so, so, uh, I lay there and I slept there until I heard the cleaning lady. Okay. And, and I got up and I kind of tiptoed around the corner of the big giant lockers. And, and I said, um, uh, hello. She started laughing in my face because she knew I got locked in the titty bar. <laughs> and I was back in the corner all night. I was so embarrassed. I was so embarrassed. I didn't even want to ca- tell my cat where I was for right. like a couple of days. I was horrified. So I, I was driving home. And I know I'm a loser. I'm a screw up. Okay. I, 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 I have a good heart. But I screw shit up all the time. So right. I get in my little Jeep and I start driving home and I'm like, oh man, I always thought I was a loser, but I really outdid myself this time. So I'm driving home. I'm so embarrassed. I don't know what to do. I don't know what to say. What if, and I finally, I was scared. I was like, they're going to know. They're going right. to see me on, on the security cameras. So they're going to know. And mm-hmm. I'm going to get fired. Um, I'm back at work and I think it was my second shift back and I was so nervous and scared to death. Finally, I went up to the general manager. His name's Lloyd. He's hilarious. And they knew I did comedy too. So they knew that, you know, I I was a smart ass and always cracking jokes and everything. Mm -hmm. And I said, Lloyd, I got to tell you something. Uh, I'm pretty embarrassed and you might want to fire me, but I got to fess up. And he said, Oh, what'd you do? And he makes a motion like, well, like, would you give a blow job or something? And I was like, oh, no, no. <laughs> So I started telling him the story. Right. <laughs> he couldn't let me finish the story because he was laughing in my face so hard. <laughs> So, you know, like, I thought they so, you know, he was cool with me. He knows I worked hard. I was like ex military, you know, I was a comic. I was struggling along. So, you know, I thought he'd kind of be protective. You know, she's a good worker. Keep it hush hush so that other people didn't know and think, well, you should fire her and get rid right. of her. Right. You know, oh no. Oh no. Everyone. That, everyone, in a second, word. The news travels fast. Everybody in the titty bar knew. Customers, regulars, DJ, everybody, all the managers, all the girls, they knew like by the time I crossed the room. So it's like within moments, everyone's coming up to me going, you look tan. Have you been <laughs> in the tanning bed? Have you? And all I could do was look at Lloyd and say, the perimeter's secure, sir. Give him a little salute and say, I'm, I'm going to go wait tables now. <laughs> so hold on okay let's back up here i have questions for you <laughs> so look i get the appeal of going into a tanning bed well let me rephrase that i've heard stories about why people go into tanning beds uh for those of you guys who don't know what i look like never in my life have i needed a tanning bed let me make that abundantly clear to all of you i have natural melanin um what prompted you to actually go in well in houston everybody has at least a little bit of color. Right. So, you know, you can't be at a titty bar and all skimpy with your, you know, flesh hanging out and not have it look a little bit, you know, golden. You you don't have that problem. You're gorgeous naturally. 
Hey, I'm a white girl. I gotta, I gotta like get some cancer and shit to kind of make me look okay in a bikini. So there's that. Hold on. <laughs> so when you went in there, you, you were wearing your work outfit. You were in a bikini. No, you take your clothes off. So I even got locked into the titty bar naked. <laughs> <laughs> How did I miss that detail of the story? Yeah, like, I didn't even know. I assumed you went in in, like, you know, like a bikini or something covered, but you were just walking around. Did you know where your clothes was? Yeah, it's like a little room, and there's a tanning bed in there. So Got it. you just go in, you shut the door, you lock it, and, you know, okay. take your clothes off, crawl in the tanning bed, you know? And fall asleep. <laughs> Sometimes I'll put the teeth bleach on, and then... And lay there with my mouth open like like I'm a corpse, so that you know I could bleach my teeth real good. Right. Ah, maybe some maybe some some bronzer, some you know tanning bed bronzer. Oh yeah, there's all kind of tricks to that. <laughs> I see, see what I was imagining. So this was what was going through my head. I thought, like I know you mentioned the locker room and everything out back, but for whatever reason, I thought it was like out on the main floor. So it's like next up to the stage is cherry pie, and then like you know someone's dancing while you're just passed out in a tanning bed getting ignored by everyone else. That was what I was imagining. Oh, no, no, no. It's like in the back room. It's a like over by the hair salon. It's a separate little room in the back and everything. So, no, it's not just like wide open, you know, people are getting cocktails and lap dances and there I am getting naked and <laughs> playing and, you know. <laughs> I mean, if they, if they left me there and locked the place up there and I was just like right in the middle of the crowd, that, right. that, was, that would be on them. No, that's what I was imagining. That was the first thing. The second thing I was imagining is, you know, you're, when you mentioned how you had to take your clothes off, I was like, whoa, what if someone had stolen her clothes? So I was imagining, like, you, like, disoriented, looking for your clothes, walking around while locked inside this place without your clothes. So I know that you are, you know, this podcast is supposed to be about, like, the revision of the story. Right. To, to make it, you know, what would you change? So I guess... uh somehow, um, if we made this story better, I would have lost my clothes and I would be walking <laughs> around the titty bar going, hello, locked in alone, but naked. <laughs> While on camera, <laughs> the surveillance camera. I got you. Okay. So let's go ahead. Let's, let's jump into this. Let's have a little fun with this story. So go ahead and retell your story and ch let's change more facts. Let's change other things and let's play around with it. Let's see what would happen. What, uh, what do you want to change? Okay, now I'm a stripper. <laughs> Same thing. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe more scared to get fired. <laughs> that didn't change. Now, I did actually, you know, I did actually uh, try stripping. And um, this really happened. Okay. Quote, because you know, they knew me because I was uh, I was a cocktail waitress first, so they mm -hmm. knew I was a co uh, in comedy and everything like that. Right. So, what you know, <laughs> graduation day happens at some point, you know, for a cocktail waitress. Instead of the tassel going from right to left, it goes from right to left titty. To, <laughs> the little tassels moving around. Uh, I, anyway, so I guess I had graduation day and I tried to dance. And uh, I danced for a guy that was a regular there, kind of taking pity on me. How'd that go? I danced for a guy, and he told me to stick to comedy. <laughs> <laughs> wow. <laughs> Is there any bigger compliment? <laughs> so, now, okay. Did, was that like a one-time thing that you that you tried this dance, or did you do it like a few more times after? I, I tried for like a little while, a few times on and off. I'm terrible at it. You can actually find a <laughs> article. Uh, Psychology Today did an article about me talking about it because the the difference now. I later on I go go danced in Jersey, which was totally different because it was just bikini. Right. And it was it was just me being on stage. I didn't have to give lap dances and hustle and all that kind of stuff. I just got all flash dance with a feeling and danced my butt off on stage. And I had a ball. I loved it. Um, you know, still a lot of creepiness and, you know, have to be careful cause it could be unsafe, but right. not, it's just not the same level as an actual strip club. Mm -hmm. Being in a strip club, I mean, it's more about the hustle. So you got to really get these guys, you know, hey, that believe that something more is going to happen. 
that's not me. I'm a dork. I'm a performer. I can be on stage and right. I can I can dance my butt off, but I, 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 can't, I can't try to drag money off of somebody and kind of make them believe something that isn't reality. I just, I can't, it's not who I am. So, uh, but I, I, I did try it for a bit. I can't do the stripping thing. (laughs) I I suck at it. And I know. (laughs) Was it empowering for you? Um, the go-go dancing is okay. Well, being on stage to me is, um, I, I prefer to be in a key in a bikini, you know, (laughs) being a go-go dancer is kind of like all the, the, uh, mental trauma of being a stripper without the confidence in your physical appearance. That's basically (laughs) So I like the, you know, I kept my clothes, you know, it was, you know, skimpy bikini, but I had a bikini on and I was just dancing. And, you know, I'm, you know, probably 10 feet away from any guy and they're just throwing me dollars and everything like that. You know, it's, it's simple. It's adorable. And it's a great workout. (laughs) <laughs> so that was different but um but yeah i go go dance for a while and i think i just got off of my train <laughs> no 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 you're, you're perfectly fine no you're perfectly fine so let let's run this back so what would you have re- how would you have reacted if uh, someone had come in in the middle of the night and found you asleep on the couch afterwards i i mean thank goodness that the cleaning lady found me because at least she could laugh at my face and not be mad at me <laughs> I mean, stop to think for just a moment what that would have been like if the cops had some alarm go off. Right. And he and the general manager had to get woken up late at night and show up to find me. There's me asleep on the couch because I got locked in. (laughs) (laughs) How do you think that would have played out? You think they would have been angry? (laughs) <laughs> yeah <laughs> when's the last t- time somebody woke you up because one of your friends did something stupid and you had to go clean up the mess were you happy that, look that's fair <laughs> i only ask because i like it seems to me like when you told the story like they were laughing about it when they heard about it Is that, i was like i don't know maybe they would have found you and just thought it was funny well you know there's a big difference when you hear about it after it's done or if you have to deal with it good old lloyd he didn't have to deal with it he had the luxury of just making fun of me (laughs) fair enough so you mentioned that you were doing a lot of this stuff to help you on your you know on your comedy career because they gave you a lot of flexibility is there anything else that you wish you would have done differently that might have also uh helped push you into your comedy career um, you know, I ended up falling into that and doing a lot of go-go dancing, which was a lot of fun. And it still gave me the flexibility to get out on the road. But, you know, I spent so many years in New York and I was an intermittent face. You know, I wasn't in the, the comedy scene and, and showing up at the bars enough because I was trying to work every shift that I could because, hey, New York is expensive. And, um, you know, I was working at night all the time in order to pay my bills. So, you know, I don't know. I mean, I wasn't even just doing that. I was temping during the day mm-hmm. and, uh, you know, working in the bars at night. So, I mean, I was working really hard. I wasn't right. just even being lazy and, oh, I'm just going to be in a bikini and let people tip me, you know, like I was actually trying to have a, a real job too on top of, you know, chasing the dream on, you know, on New York budget, it's hard. And that's why I'm really worried about that part of New York coming back after COVID is because so many of these restaurants are closing up. Well, you know, Broadway is closed until uh, next year sometime. Um, You know, they're part of what you know, made this city exciting is all the performing arts. Well, the performing artists aren't able to afford to be here. Right. Especially when they don't have the jobs of waiting tables and bartending and things like that available. Temping, you know, like I, you know, I was an executive assistant and, you know, receptionist and stuff like that. All those jobs are, are gone as well because everybody's working from home. So, like 
Yeah. Uh, it, it's kind of funny that like, I never thought that in, uh, in a bad situation, I wouldn't at least have some sort of employment at a titty bar to fall back <laughs> on. But <laughs> times are so crazy. Even that's not available. <laughs> Wait, you, uh, can you still do it? You, you think you still got it? Oh, they asked me to pick up a shift on Sunday. <laughs> <laughs> I'm 48 and gentlemen, years old. She you still know, got it. <laughs> well, because here's what, here, you know, it's, it's, it's funny. It's like <laughs> I get called a dying breed because, <laughs> because I really dance really hard. And uh, I don't know. The kids these days, they put on a bikini. They don't take care of themselves. They're not in shape. Uh, they don't dance really hard. They, they're, they don't perform. They just kind of want to get tipped just for being there. And I'm like, no, you got to work. <laughs> Let me ask you something. Paul yeah. would say, you better work. <laughs> Did this... uh? This experience, right? Was this before uh, you started acting and doing all the other stuff? Oh, okay. So there's a plus. Right. That came out of it. <laughs> I mean, even though that's kind of, I mean, I, I, I actually put myself in some scary and unsafe situations. Right. Just trying to get by working in that world. You know, it's, it's, it's not really that glamorous. Uh, but, uh, but it did lead to, yes, getting me a spot playing stripper number two in The Wolf of Wall Street. And That's it was right. because uh, I, I worked at, um, I actually worked at the Bada Bang. The, uh, it's Satin Dolls out in Jersey, and it's a go-go bar. And <laughs> right. it's, where they, it's where they filmed the uh, uh, Bada Bing scenes in The Sopranos. And the girl that helped book uh, those girls for the bada bing scenes and in, in, in the show, it was, they were nude, but in reality it was go-go bar and just bikini. So, um, she got a call to help find girls for Wolf of Wall Street. So she's the one that put my name in. I thought she was full of shit for a minute there. She right. was like, you want to be in a movie? I'm like, oh yeah, sure. I went, it's with that guy. What guy? What's his name? I don't know what you're talking about. Leonardo DiCaprio. Yeah, sure. I'd love to be in a movie. <laughs> DiCaprio and that other guy. What's that? What, you, what other guy? It's a, and that was McConaughey. And sure, I, th I thought she was completely full of BS. And um, she said, you got pictures? And I had just done a photo shoot for a, um, uh, a pinup for the troops. Right. And... And uh, so if your listeners want that pinup, uh, I can, you know, maybe mail them to you for a small charge because everybody <laughs> needs some drinking money this year. Woo. Anyway, so, uh, <laughs> so anyway, I had just done this photo shoot. So I had a bunch of like updated pictures and everything like that. I sent them off. And the next thing you know, they were calling me up to set for costume, which was trying on heels and a thong. <laughs> Hey, look, it sounds like, you know, this worked out for you. It broke even. <laughs> what would you revise on that story? <laughs> I mean, yeah, I, I don't know because I personally don't look good in a bikini. So I, I don't know that I've ever been in that situation. <laughs> I bet that if you wanted to shake it, a lot of dollars would go in your thong. I don't know about that. You know, I. <laughs> You know, I don't, I don't really have a six pack. It's more of a one keg kind of situation over here, <laughs> you know? So I, I, I don't know, maybe, maybe if you're into the dad bod, I don't, I don't know. <laughs> As we start to wrap this up a little bit here. So one of the things that we like doing on the podcast is we like ending it on a positive note. What's one memory from your childhood or something that puts a smile on your face from when you were growing up? Nothing. Nothing. <laughs> I'm miserable. I'm clearly a miserable person and always have been my whole entire life. <laughs> oh my. <laughs> I have the sweetest mom in the whole entire world and a dad who is absolutely hilarious. So uh, even going through tough times that I was too embarrassed to tell them I was going through. <laughs> 
<laughs> I was lucky enough to have really great family and really great parents that, um, you know, even just thinking of them still makes my heart warm all the time. So yeah, I'm pretty lucky there. Uh, so, uh, you know, that's a good reminder to reach out to the people that you love and know love you. <laughs> <laughs> Fair enough. And then, uh, one last thing is, uh, I'd like to encourage people to give back and support uh, organizations and charities. Is there anyone that you're particularly passionate about? There, there is a um, charity in a home for, uh, I, I have a lot of friends that are um, LBGT and, uh, you know, transgender friends. And, you know, they've gone through a lot. Um, now, I... <laughs> I actually, no, we didn't get into that, but I actually gone, I've gone through a lot of really being treated like I was less than human because I worked dancing, right. which who cares? I'm right. not hurting anybody. It's like, I'm, I'm not a dirt bag. I don't do drugs and you could be a dirt bag in any job. It Absolutely. doesn't matter. you the title doesn't define you as a person. And, um, you know, to see my friends and hear their stories of what they dealt with just because they were gay or, right. you, you know, they were transgender. Like, there's there's no reason for that. So there's a really great charity that helps out um, teens who um, who are basically thrown out of their house because, uh, you know, their family doesn't agree with their lifestyle and, uh, you know, they have some really scary, sad stories. It's tough to be a kid who's young and gay and just trying to figure out who he is, she yeah. is in life, and then thrown out of your house because of how you feel inside. So, and that actually happens way too much. I would encourage everyone to support. Um, and then the, the last thing is, uh, before I let you go, do you have any last word for our revisionaries? How about just, you know, like RuPaul says, since I started out talking about RuPaul in the beginning, <laughs> she ends every episode with, if you can't love yourself, how the hell are you going to love somebody else? Can I get an amen? So uh, no matter what you're going through, uh, try to laugh, uh, try to be strong, and um, remember to love and be kind to yourself. Oh, I love it. Thank you so much for coming. And, and how can we follow you? How can our, our listeners follow you? Um, you can find me at Tracy Jane. Uh, it's T-R-A-C-I-E-J-A-Y-N-E. -E. You can find a fan page and a personal page. I forget about making those likes, uh, uh, those friend requests happen. They sit in my box for like months yeah. on my personal page, but you can definitely find me on my, <laughs> <laughs> on my fan page. And you can also find me the Tracy Jane underscore on, on, uh, Instagram. So, uh, look me up and I do have, uh, tracyjane.com, but you know, that's one of those things that I meant to update while we were on COVID, and that hasn't happened. That went, that went the way with the drinking less and flossing more. <laughs> <laughs> oh man, well, thank you so much for coming on to the podcast. I really thank you appreciate so much for having me. I'm so honored that you, you asked me to be on the Revisionary Podcast. So, uh, yeah, wow. Um, that is, <laughs> that, that, that's how that story left me. I don't know how you fall asleep. Like, I, like that story, I enjoyed. See, this is what I'm saying. I, Tracy's just full of stories, and I just enjoy listening to her. And that is a classic example of another story that I just loved listening to so, so much. Also, on a side note, uh, we were, while we were recording this one, you know, we had, I had like a, so just a little side note, I'm also part of something called uh, Blue Straw Entertainment. Shout out to Blue Straw Entertainment. And uh, we were recording a promo video, so like it was being filmed. So I had uh, someone <laughs> videoing me from the sides while we were recording this. So that was added a whole interesting uh, little uh, tidbit to that. So uh, just be on the lookout. But anywho, this has been such a pleasure, and I always appreciate you guys uh, tuning in. And as I like to end every show, thank you for listening. This is